Hello everyone, I'm Lara Evdakimova and I will be your moderator for this topic session. This session has been recorded. It will be available with all the materials by the link later. Please feel comfortable asking questions. Put your question in the chat uh, in our live event QA panel on the right. We answer them at the end of the presentation. Please let me introduce the speaker. Katerina Shapeleva worked with accessibility testing for four years in a row. She made various deep researches and conducted several talks on this topic. And so interesting fact is uh, she started her career in IT 11 years ago as a technical support specialist and gained interesting experience in internet technologies. I best the word to Katerina. Please, Katerina starts the presentation. Hello everyone, I uh, hope you can hear and see me well. Um, yeah, today I will be talking about accessibility and what testers usually do not consider. And in the very beginning, just a couple of words about myself, a couple of more words from what was already mentioned. Uh, I am a software testing team leader and I work in a PAM Ukraine. Uh, as it was mentioned, I have 11 years of experience in IT. Out of them, nine and a half are in QA sphere. Out of them, five and a half are in EPAM, and uh, four and a half are actually already in accessibility. Uh, four of them are on my current project. And uh, before we would proceed, um, usually when I conduct some uh, talks uh, in offline mode, I can ask people to raise their hands and answer my questions. But uh, because this is an online event, uh, this format is not really possible so that's why i would ask you to go to menti.com uh, use uh, the code that you can see on the screen it is 6830 and uh, please answer the question are you familiar with accessibility testing or not there are four options and uh, we will see the results and it would really help me to understand uh, how deeply should i uh, stop on some accessibility basics or all of them are real experts already and I do not really need to spend too much time on that part. So let's check how voting goes. Don't be shy. I will also vote. <laughs> We also have experts on the line. OK. So I see there are representatives from different uh, groups of voting. Um, most of uh, guys for now say that they heard something, tried accessibility a bit. Uh, some guys know nothing at all, and we have uh, some pretty experienced um, people on the line as well. OK, cool. Uh, you may continue voting, uh, and uh, later on it would be uh, uh, interesting for me to check the results um, if the numbers would increase. So please just continue, and for now I will proceed with my slides. Um, anyway, as we have uh, some guys who voted for the first option that they do not uh, know anything about accessibility, I will have just one slide with accessibility basics so that it would be easier for you to comprehend uh, the main part of my talk. Uh, so first of all, this is a subset of usability testing, so it is non-functional testing type. Target audience of this type of uh, testing are people with disabilities, but not only. Goal of this testing type is to make sure that website or application or whatever you guys are developing in your teams are accessible for different groups of people in different situations, conditions, circumstances, whatever. There are several reasons why you would want to pay attention to this te uh, testing type. Among them are law, 
because there might be already an existing legislation in some country where your customers operate, but also there must, might be some potential lawsuits if people who want to use your application, but they are unable to do so because your website is not accessible or application, uh, they may actually come to the court uh, with their uh, concerns. Also money, uh, your customers may earn more money if they attract more people uh, who are going to use their application because uh, it would become more accessible. Also best practices, for example, there are some giants existing on the market in your business domain and they may already uh, start doing their websites application more accessible and you may follow the same practice and uh, try to do the same and social responsibility. It is last but not the least because currently it is uh, sort of a trend. Uh, it becomes more popular thinking not only about yourself but about something bigger as well. Uh, so it might be a good a reason uh, to, for you to try accessibility as well and suggest trying it on your projects. And a couple of words about testing specifics of accessibility. Among them are uh, you may be using some special checkers. I will be talking about them a bit in uh, details um, further. You also most probably would be using some screen readers uh, that would be pronouncing what is happening on the screen. Uh, most probably you would be also working with keyboard navigation while testing accessibility and there are much more additional checks uh, and they would depend on uh, what content is there in uh, your application, what the business domain is uh, and so on. So this is in short about accessibility in just one slide. Before I would proceed with my main part, uh, disclaimer. Do you need to stay here on this talk? Uh, yes, if you want to go deeper into accessibility. If you already know something about accessibility, but you want to uh, broaden your horizons of the knowledge, uh, this is for you. Also, if you want to find out about frequent mistakes, what is usually missed, uh, what people usually misunderstand and so on, I will be sharing some of those examples. And if your project does accessibility not just for the sake of appearance, not just to say that, well, yeah, our application is accessible, but in reality it wouldn't be. Um, if you guys are really interested in helping people who might be using your application, I hope this would be useful and interesting for you. So what am I going to cover in my talk? Um, how target audience behaves, uh, what requirements are usually missed by QAs, what to do when questions appear but the answer is not clear, and A and AA levels of WCAG standard. This is the standard used for accessibility. Uh, there is one more level exists, uh, it is triple A, but the rules there are really strict and usually only like let, let's say mostly uh, only government uh, companies are uh, trying to follow this triple A level. Um, so most probably you wouldn't have to deal with it. Uh, that is why I am omitting it just to not bother you with something you would not need. Uh, let me start from the section about target audience and what to consider there. Uh, first, let me introduce to you some guy. Uh, his name is Dmitry Popov and he is a blind developer. He is an accessibility expert and uh, he works with companies helping them uh, to test their applications and to fix the issues. And he is a screen readers user. He uses uh, screen readers in his uh, daily work uh, because uh, he's blind and otherwise he wouldn't be able to use computer, uh, mobile phone and so on. Uh, Together with Dmitro, we once conducted a talk um, about how to test accessibility as a person from target audience. And while I was preparing to that talk, I was able to clarify many uncertainties I had about accessibility. And I will be sharing some of those insights uh, that Dmitro uh, told me uh, during my talk, mm, but also some of those uh, things that I will be talking about are my uh, personal observations. Now, Dmitry sometimes uh, still uh, consults me on some uh, questions I have about accessibility because he really strives for making web more accessible and uh, he is glad that there are people who are concerned about accessibility and uh, he is eager to help. 
So uh, the first thing I would like to mention is that I noticed that pretty frequently developers and QAs are mostly focusing on uh, blindness as uh, one of the disabilities uh, that uh, should be considered during testing and bug fixing. But in reality, there are much more uh, disabilities types uh, that should also be considered. I already mentioned that uh, that is such a standard called WCG. Its uh, latest version is 2.1 and there are 78 points sort of requirements uh, for accessibility that exist in this uh, standard. And do want to know how many points out of this 78 are blindness only related? Just one. It is about meaningful sequence. I checked them all and the rest 77 points mention several types of disabilities uh, which would benefit uh, from implementing this or, or that requirement. This means that while you are testing your application, you need to think of more scenarios in which people might uh, be and this would help you to think of more cases that should be verified and this would help developers to fix box in a more appropriate way. So this is the first thing that I wanted to uh, remind you about, not only blindness. Next, I would like to talk about the tool set and um, I will be mostly talking about screen readers. So when I just uh, started working on my current project, I uh, prepared an analysis for existing screen readers uh, to understand which would suit our project needs, uh, needs more. And out of those screen readers that I checked, uh, my personal favorite was uh, Chromebox. This is a screen reader developed by Google. And uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't work for us and I didn't select it uh, because we were supposed to support three browsers, Internet Explorer, Edge and Chrome, but this browser worked, uh, sorry, this screen reader works only in Chrome browser. Another reason why uh, we didn't select Chromebox uh, was because um, it was not really used by people much. Uh, the percentage uh, for this screen reader was really, uh, really low and uh, the screen uh, shots from survey uh, that you see on the screen are from the latest survey, like from the last year. Uh, when I was collecting uh, this information, performing this analysis, uh, the picture was a bit different, but still Chromebox was uh, in the bottom of, of the table. I was sort of surprised by that because I really like this Chromebox screen reader, but anyway, we haven't selected it. Of course, uh, yeah, we paid more attention to NVIDIA and JAWS that were on uh, the first um, places in this table. Uh, actually, NVIDIA is now on the first place, but it uh, for all the previous years, it was uh, lower than that. Uh, JAWS was on the first uh, place and uh, I'm sort of glad that uh, the situation changes because JAWS um, it is not free and it is really expensive uh, but NVDA is uh, free it is open source and it is being developed by people with disabilities so uh, the target audience actually develops this tool and it becomes more and more popular and this is great uh, but anyway um, we decided that we would be using NVDA and not the Chromebox. Why I am telling you all of this? Um, when I was uh, preparing to the talk with Dmitro, I asked, asked why people are not using Chromebox. It was not clear for me because like there were several reasons what was good about this screen reader. Uh, the only thing that didn't suit me is that uh, it didn't support Internet Explorer and Edge. But what Dmitro said, uh, this screen reader works only with Chrome browser not with anything else, not with Outlook, not with Skype, not with some notepad or other programs that you might have open on your PC. But when people are working with screen readers, they expect that everything, everything that happens on the screen would be pronounced. And it is impossible to use Chromebox in Chrome, but then when you are switching to Outlook, for example, you would be selecting some different screen reader. So this is definitely not the case, and this is the reason why people are not using it, but it was not 
not obvious to me at all. So recommendation here to you is to select some tools that suit not um, only your project needs, but also uh, suit uh, real people who would be working with uh, your application and would be using some particular screen readers. So yeah, that's so uh, about uh, Chromevox of my strange story. Uh, but anyway, let's continue with screen readers because there are a lot of insights that I can share. Uh, the next thing is that uh, while working with a screen reader and I will be mostly talking about NVDA and I will be showing you screenshots from it, but uh, most probably same things are available in other screen readers as well. So in NVDA, uh, you can uh, go to tools and uh, click on speech viewer. And in this case, uh, for the website that you would be testing or the application, whatever, you would see this small window uh, called NVDA speech viewer where text uh, that is being pronounced by a screen reader would be available for reading. So if you do not want to listen to the screen reader, you may also read it here. And I must say that on my project, I, I think almost all the developers are using this spe speech viewer. They turn off pronunciation by NVDA at all and they are just reading. What I believe here and what also Dmitra recommends for QAs who are working with accessibility is to get used to listening to screen reader because it's important not only to check that the text is correct or that uh, it is present at all, but also that it is being pronounced on time because when uh, some element is in focus uh, at once, uh, some text should be pronounced uh, without any delays. And in theory, you might not see this uh, using this speech viewer. For example, I even had such bug on my project when there was a delay uh, before some uh, element uh, was pronounced. And I must say that uh, real people who are working with screen readers, they are using a very high speed of uh, pronunciation in the screen reader. And they might even think that if there is a delay of several seconds, that element is not being pronounced at all, and it would be pretty confusing for them. They may even switch to the next element using like tab uh, button, for example, and they would not even know what that element was. So my personal recommendation and Mitch recommends the same is to try to get used to listening to uh, the screen reader rather than using this speech viewer uh, mode. Again, to continue with screen readers, uh, in the screen reader itself, in particular in NVDA, there are two modes for browsing and for focusing. So what it means? Uh, when you uh, just start in VDA, if you uh, check this checkbox to use caps lock as a modifier key, and then if you go to preferences uh, to browse mode and uh, uncheck uh, this checkbox for ad uh, audio indication for focus and browse modes, then you would be uh, able to do the following. Whenever you are using NVDA, uh, using caps lock plus space uh, combination, you might switch between focus mode mode and browse mode. Uh, what these two modes do? In browse mode, um, you may be able to read uh, out with a screen reader uh, those elements that are not even focusable. So for example, as you see on the screenshot from our community, Z, uh, attend button is definitely focusable. You can uh, get to this uh, button using tab uh, key on your keyboard, but our most voted speakers is just a text. You cannot uh, put it into focus, but using this browse mode, you can still uh, listen uh, to this text uh, in your screen reader. And usually this browse mode is being used for some uh, reading complex documents or reading some articles with no focusable elements uh, in it and so on. Uh, so people from the target audience who are working with screen readers in their everyday life, they are switching between these two modes all the time. While focus, it's like a regular um, mode for just uh, working with focusable elements. And sometimes NVDA even automatically switches between these two um, modes without uh, asking uh, you as a screen reader user. So why again I'm talking about this here on our project uh, we had several cases when we were creating bugs 
uh, which were not really bugs. Uh, the problem is that in two of these modes, there are different hotkeys uh, used for different combinations. So for example, if usually you can open some drop down menu using enter button in browse mode, you will have to click control enter. And what our QAC, they click enter, nothing happens. They are creating a bug. They think that this is uh, just not working functionality in terms of accessibility. But in reality, they are just in browse mode that they are not aware of and they think that this is a bug. And in the very beginning, we had to spend a lot of uh, time on investigation, uh, thinking what to do, how to fix this, uh, but this was just not really a bug at all. So again, my recommendation here is to find out about these two modes, uh, understand how they work, what hotkeys work in each, and uh, not be creating uh, bugs that are not really bugs. Again, to continue with the screen readers, as you see, this is a hot topic. Um, for example, we have a field called application date and uh, there are uh, some rules on what uh, format is expected. So you can see that uh, there is an error message under it and um, in the very beginning, uh, a screen reader would pronounce this text that you actually see under this field date MMDD YYYY or an A really meaningful, nothing is clear if a person cannot see this field and he or she just comprehends the information with his or her ears, uh, probably it might be a challenge to understand what is act actually expected from, um, from him or from her to put into this field. Uh, for your information, you can put a friendly message that would be pronounced by the screen reader. So this is HTML of this field. As you see on the first line, there is that actual text that is being displayed on UI, uh, but inside the code, and it is not visible on UI at all, it is only visible visible for the screen reader, uh, there is another message. In this case, it is like date should be formatted as MMDD, uh, YYYY, and in the range from uh, this year to that year. Frankly speaking, I still do not personally like this message. I would probably correct it even more. For example, I would say that it is application date and not just some date but most probably there's just generic message used for several date fields, but anyway, and it should be formatted as months, months, day, day, year, 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 or an A value. Um, speaking about this range that is there in this friendly message, most probably it is some separate error message uh, that when uh, your date corresponds to the format, but it doesn't correspond to the range uh, expected. Uh, this is a separate uh, error message and I would personally prefer to uh, have it separately, not everything in one place. But anyway, uh, the uh, story is about uh, the opportunity to have in this text hidden in your uh, HTML and uh, you would not have to change your UI uh, so that it would fit or something, uh, but still it would be uh, possible to pronounce some more meaningful text rather than this just MMDD YYYY. And uh, one more thing about um, what I found out uh, during this time and uh, for this particular point from Dimitro in particular. So in our application we have a shopping cart and uh, there are several steps and you can get back to the previous step using previous button or uh, you can go to the next uh, step uh, using next button. And uh, when you are using keyboard navigation, the first button that is uh, in focus is previous and th then next because elements are usually being selected from left to right, just the same as first name would be selected first and then last name field. Um, I thought that probably this is not a good idea to do so because in most cases you would prefer to go to the next step and you would want to go to the previous step only when there is some error and you need to correct something. Uh, so I su suggested to fix this bug <laughs> and uh, to first select next uh, button uh, during keyboard navigation and then previous. And I, frankly speaking, I thought that I am a genius because nobody ever thought about that before me. And this is a really great idea, improved user experience. But uh, when I was talking to Dimitro and I asked about this particular case, whether it was a good idea or not, of course, yes. Uh, he said 
Well, surprisingly, no, uh, because uh, consistency is really important. And uh, if on all the applications, uh, usually elements are being selected from left to right, a person who cannot see the screen would expect the same here. So again, expected order uh, should be the, the very first uh, order that was uh, implemented by default, uh, previous button and then next. And there is even a requirement in WCAG related to this. It is called consistent navigation. And uh, why again uh, this should be like that? So Dmitra mentioned that, for example, there would be some bug that uh, button is not clickable or uh, maybe there is some validation error uh, in the form and that is why button is disabled but um, person doesn't understand what is going on so he or she may ask his or her friend or family member to click on some button and if we first select next they would think that this button is on the left and they would ask uh, their friend or family member to click this button that is on the left but in reality it is on the right. So just to not confuse people, let's not fix this genius box like I suggested doing uh, because consistency is really important. The next uh, topic is about accessibility standards that are usually being missed. So in most cases, how testing is usually done? Uh, most probably you are using some checkers like Wave or Totally or something similar. Uh, then you would be checking uh, how everything is being pronounced using the screen reader, for example, NVDA or JOS or something else. Um, again, most probably you would be checking uh, the keyboard navigation, whether it's possible to select everything from the keyboard. And depending on the business domain or on what content is available in your product, you might be also checking some audio, video, capture or whatever you have and in most cases that would be it because frankly speaking I even saw on my own project in some user stories uh, business analysts are posting sort of a checklist for ADA um, in accessibility testing uh, and it consists of wave NVDA and keyboard navigation and that's it so in most cases QAs are checking these three points and that's it but there are many, many more requirements that are usually being forgotten and I will give you just several examples, but in reality there are more. As you remember in the latest version of WCAG, there are 78 uh, points, uh, 78 requirements and each of them uh, should uh, require some attention. Let me start from keyboard navigation. There are a couple of things that you may want to pay your attention to. For example, no keyboard trap. Uh, imagine that you have some pop-up or model window opened on your screen and when you close this pop-up or model window, focus uh, just goes away. You are not sure what exactly is currently in focus and if you are also reading, uh, listening to screen reader, it may not even pronounce anything at this point because you are not sure where your focus is and this is a really bad thing uh, because for people who cannot see the screen and they are not sure what is going on what is happening where is the focus what to do um, it might be a problem and uh, of course, in most cases, it can be resolved by just clicking tab key again. And in this case, just the very first element on the page would be selected. Uh, but again, what if it is a really long page and uh, you do not want to start from the very beginning and uh, focus in on the very first element on the screen? And maybe when you click tab, nothing would even happen and it would be only possible to return focus to the page uh, with your mouse but person is not using mouse because they can only use keyboard so this is a bad thing and uh, I, I mentioned that there are three levels um, under WCAG standard uh, and as you see this requirement corresponds to level A. It means that this is the minimum set of requirements and if your application does not meet this minimum requirements, then people with disabilities would not be able to use your application at all. So this is a really important requirement and why uh, usually we may miss this because 
if we cannot see the focus, we would just click with our mouse somewhere and we would return the focus to the page. But people with disabilities, uh, they cannot do this. So just keep this in mind. And one more point here also related to keyboard. It is about focus visibility. So if person is not blind, but he or she has very low vision and it is hard for them to see what is happening to understand, it's very important for them to keep a focus focus on uh, selected elements so that it would be clear of what interaction is expected right now. And uh, moreover, they may not be using screen readers that may pronounce the name of the element that is currently highlighted. Uh, that is why it should be possible to track this from UI. Um, sometimes this border for focused uh, element might be too small, too hardly visible. Again, about hardly uh, visible, uh, it's like usually by default this border is in blue and imagine that the background color of your page is also in the same blue color and again it wouldn't be visible what exactly is uh, selected at the moment. It is not that critical requirement you see this is level double A but still this is also important keep this in mind. Another interesting requirement about resizing text, but not only text, uh, it is about Zoom for up to 200 uh, percent in uh, your application. So, for example, person has really low vision and it is important for them to zoom in the pages uh, to be able to see the text and everything else. I found an example uh, on uh, W3 uh, schools website. I hope uh, I hope you heard of it. So there are um, eight buttons uh, that would lead you to specific uh, page on this website so that you could learn some particular topic. And as you see in my browsers, there is a zoom on 175%. And when you zoom to 200, and this is mentioned in the standard, uh, there are only three buttons left. And if you scroll down, you wouldn't see the remaining uh, buttons. Like there are five buttons that just disappear. And I saw this in several applications that, uh, for example, some important buttons that uh, like without them, you cannot finish the flow. They would just go out of the visible area and there is no scroll bar and you just cannot get to them in any way. Uh, and the problem here is that if person has a really uh, bad vision, uh, they may be using this uh, percentage of zoom by default and they would not see that on 175% there are buttons and on 200 there are no buttons then you just need to zoom out and click this button and then zoom in again again no as soon as they open this page it would uh, already be 200 and they would not be aware that there are some buttons left that they cannot see uh, and of course um, when you are testing this, you should not care about styles, some shifting, something related to UI. No, it's only about functionality and content that is essential uh, for the user and uh, especially if it is some button to proceed to the next step of some flow and without this button they wouldn't be able to finish the flow. So this is this is a problem. Just do not forget to check for this. Uh, the next uh, re requirement, I hope you understand what it is about. It is about flashes uh, because uh, too frequent flashes may uh, cause seizures. Um, sometimes uh, there might be such advertisements uh, built into the pages uh, with some flashes uh, so that people would definitely notice these advertisements and the problem here is that during testing on queue environment you might not be even able to see this advertisement because it will only be uh, added in production so here uh, for you um, is it's expected from you if you say that 
uh, your website is accessible. Just make sure to uh, notify your customers that if your application uses some sort of advertisements, they should make sure that there are going to be no flashes. If it is possible, you need to test it yourself on production. Uh, if no, if you do not have access to production, then just uh, make sure to properly communicate this. Maybe your POs uh, will notify clients who are building advertisements into your website that there should be no uh, flashes. And uh, another thing is related to contrast. So as you see, when there is a high contrast between the background color and text color, it's much easier to see the text. And when the ratio between uh, the background color and the text uh, color is uh, low, it's much harder to read this text. And it's applicable not only to people with disabilities. Uh, it can be applied to almost everyone depending on how bright your screen is or what uh, the basic conditions are and so on. So previously uh, there was a uh, 2.0 version of WCAG standard and there was one requirement, uh, like one main requirement related to contrast. Uh, now, in the latest version, there is one more uh, requirement related to contrast, so they are trying to pay our attention to this topic. And even in the wave tool, the checker that I mentioned, as you see, contrast uh, was previously on a separate tab. And when you would be checking your application using wave, you might not even go to the separate tab and you might not even find out that there are some contrast errors found. But in the latest uh, wave uh, version, you may see that now contrast errors are on the same tab where all other errors are and it is not somewhere in the bottom of the list it is like on the second place after all the errors so it is really important and you definitely need to make sure to uh, spend as much uh, time on this as possible uh, just to be fixing this and one more thing um, it is pretty a challenge to fix such issues uh, because, uh, for example, on my current project, uh, we are using uh, some brand colors by our customer and all the um, uh, projects under this customer are using the same color. So if you really want to fix this issue, uh, we most probably would face a problem that uh, we cannot change colors that are being used by many projects. But if you are starting a new project, it would be much easier to resolve such uh, issues with contrast in the very beginning. So just try to not forget about this. And the last but not the least re related to requirements, like I mentioned, current version of WCAG uh, standard is 2.1 and it was released uh, two years ago. Uh, but still most of the projects uh, are using the older version, which is 2.0, uh, which existed for 10 years before that. It was pretty outdated. For example, it was not including uh, details related to mobile application testing or something like that. And uh, now uh, there are more things available under this newer uh, version. So my recommendation is to definitely pay attention to the latest requirements and try to follow them. Uh, I will show you a couple of examples from what was added, uh, but still there might be more that you would be interested in. For example, like I mentioned, related to mobile applications, related to orientation, to pointer gestures, uh, also to content on hover. I know that in our application it was always um, a topic for conflicts because our UX designers wanted to use hover that uh, if you hover some element with your mouse something would be displayed uh, but uh, it's only in like by default it was only possible to do this with the mouse but uh, as I mentioned your application should also be accessible via the keyboard all the features there should be accessible so uh, hover in now is now ex uh, explicitly mentioned in the requirements also some requirements related to text spacing to status messages to notify the person what is actually happening on the screen when there are some toaster messages with statuses whatever uh, also non text contrast I already mentioned it on the previous slide but this is a new requirement added in the in latest version of the standard so there are more of them 
check uh, the link that is available on the screen. Uh, it uh, mentions new features uh, and uh, try to follow the latest requirements. OK, uh, so what to do when expected behavior is not clear? So you considered all the uh, important things, but still uh, this standard does not uh, explicitly mention something that is required for you. Uh, in this case, uh, my recommendation would be to find trustworthy sources. I will give you several of them and maybe you would be able to suggest even more from your experience. Uh, would be great if you could share in comments. The first one is W3Org website. This is the same website and company that uh, uh, prepares uh, this WCAG um, standard. So they're really uh, sure in uh, what they are suggesting. And if you go to the link uh, available on uh, the slide, uh, you would see a very area um, element examples. So this is a standard used by developers and there is a specific page where you can see how specific elements should behave. So for example, I found this carousel with uh, rotating uh, photos on the web page. Uh, we do not have such element in our application, but maybe you do. And there are many, many more uh, combo box uh, buttons, breadcrumbs and so on and so forth. So you can find almost every element that you might have on your application and here you can check how it should be um, pronounced by the screen readers. Uh, what buttons are supposed to be working from a keyboard navigation perspective and so on. So this is a really great uh, source uh, where you can go and check how something should behave. If, for example, this website does not work for you for some reason, maybe you haven't found some really unique uh, element or something, but you want to check how other uh, companies uh, do so, you may check some already existing accessible websites or applications. So, for example, in the very beginning, uh, we were also referring to how Dropbox uh, works and how selection of checkboxes works there, how uh, you are switching between rows and so on. Uh, you can do the same. You can try to Google some um, website examples. Uh, uh, Actually, I found these uh, screenshots on the article that uh, uh, showed several uh, beautiful accessible websites because this is actually one of the myths uh, that uh, if website is accessible, most probably it would look ugly. Uh, but no, uh, you see this uh, as examples. But anyway, you can also refer to Facebook, to Google, uh, to Microsoft websites because most probably they also spend a lot of efforts trying to make their websites accessible. Also, you can talk to your UX designers, designers, whoever you have on the project. We do have such guys uh, on our project and we frequently come to them. Uh, I cannot say that they are real uh, experts in accessibility, but still they can uh, recommend something from user perspective, uh, user experience uh, perspective, and uh, it would be really helpful uh, if you do have such guys and if they can recommend something uh, how to fix some accessibility related bug. And the last but not the least, you may have an accessibility expert. There are actually many options there. For example, it can be one of your colleagues who is interested in this topic and uh, they are eager to learn even more. And OK, you all together decide that this person is now an accessibility expert on your project and everyone comes to this uh, person for some advice. Uh, it can be also a certified expert because there are some certifications available for accessibility. They are pretty expensive, uh, but still if your uh, client uh, is ready to cover these expenses and to make sure that on your project you really have an, a certified accessibility expert would be great. Another option is a person with disabilities, so you can find such people like Dimitro and uh, ask them for consultancy. Um, it can be sort of beta testing or something like that and they can help help you with um, accessibility testing. And one more option that I can think of is some external consultant. So it can be a person who is a certified accessibility expert, uh, but they do not work for your project or your company, uh, but uh, you would uh, 
ask this person for some testing and for some consultancy. This is also possible. So afterwards, I do not really have some conclusions because uh, I was just sharing some insights and some info I was able to gather during my four and a half years of experience. But what I want to say in the end, don't be afraid of accessibility. Yes, it might be challenging, but this is what it makes it interesting, right? <laughs> so this is really a huge field and there is a lot to learn. Uh, as you see, I work in accessibility for four and a half years and still there are a lot of things that I'm learning. Um, so I hope that this sounds interesting. Um, I hope this was uh, useful and uh, thank you for your attention. Have fun with accessibility and let me check if there are any questions available. Thank you, Katrina, very much for your presentation. You did really great. The experience Thank was you. <laughs> so marvelous. Take a breath just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we get a couple of questions for you to answer. Let me just read it. The most popular question is how much time did it take for you to become a good specialist in this type of testing? And mm -hmm. which ways did you to improve? some something like books, conferences, etc. Because my assumption there is no much related in for analysis in the net. Um, yeah, that is right. Uh, there was not uh, much information uh, related to this topic. So what I was uh, mostly working with is this WCAG standard. It is really detailed. I mean, uh, there are OK, let me show you one screenshot. I hope this would help you to understand. Uh, so I was showing some screenshots from the standard like this. And as you see uh, here, you can click on understanding a link and it will provide you a detailed article about just this small requirement. So it's like two lines, uh, but there is like a separate article which uh, might give you more details about this uh, particular um, uh, point and also how to meet uh, this requirement. It is more like an information for developers and there are also some details on how to fix this, uh, some examples, uh, reasoning why it should be fixed and so on. And uh, this, I really love this uh, standard and this is not the only uh, the, um, accessibility related standard. There are more like section 508, for example, but this one is really great uh, and detailed and I really recommend uh, using this. And uh, the reason, I mean, there were not such uh, more in, um, existing talks or something like that. That is why I was conducting these talks. <laughs> I was uh, deeply digging into this topic and I conducted several external talks and also in IPAM just because I wanted to share this information that I got during my uh, work experience. And uh, about how much time? Well, um, well, what what does it mean good specialist? Let me uh, ask uh, you uh, because I am not a certified accessibility expert like I mentioned. I do not have any certification, so maybe I'm not a good specialist. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the more you learn, the the better it becomes. And even even in half a year, you are already uh, more proficient in this as person who never worked with it. So yeah, just start trying and everything will be OK. OK, thank you, Katrina. The next question is um, goes from uh, Viraj. Are there any automation tools available for accessibility testing? Uh, one of the talks that I conducted uh, was uh, devoted to uh, automation of accessibility testing. <laughs> and uh, when we were discussing uh, my agenda for the talk today, uh, we decided to not include this into my talk because it will take too much time. It's like a separate talk, so it would be hard to answer this uh, question in brief words. Uh, in short, yes, there are some tools, um, but they would not fully suit your needs uh, because uh, some things uh, should definitely be tested manually only. And um, so yeah, there are tools. It is possible to partially automate accessibility testing, but not fully and some manual efforts would still be required. 
Thank you. Really, it was a great question as well. Just a quick reminder to our audience. Don't be shy to ask questions, please. If you want something to clarify, please share your questions and put them on our QA panel, please. OK, the next question. As a replier of the know nothing about accessibility, can I consider that it's related to application user experience? If yes, what are differences between them? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, if we are talking about user experience uh, as a related thing to uh, usability, then uh, yeah, definitely it is related because accessibility is a subset of usability, so it's like part of it. Uh, of course, this is related, and I must say that many things that you would be fixing for accessibility would help uh, to improve usability in general. Um, well, the difference is that there are some specific things that you have to focus on during accessibility that you would not m normally pay attention to during just usability testing and fixing. For example, like this screen readers, there is a, this is a specific tool that is being used by uh, people who have issues with their vision and um, other people who are the main target audience of usability testing most probably would not be using it. So there are some specifics, but still it is definitely related. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question goes to about um, two questions actually. Maybe with this one we start. What can you say about Google Lighthouse and text tools? Is it mm -hmm. enough to use one of them for A11Y testing? Yeah, A11Y is accessibility. <laughs> it's like abbreviation. Um, and uh, I haven't uh, used uh, uh, these tools. I haven't even heard of Google Lighthouse, frankly speaking, but I heard of X tools. Uh, I uh, tried some of them, but just haven't selected them for my uh, final tool set. Uh, what can I say? Um, uh, speaking of tools, uh, what you need to have is a sort of a, a checker for HTML like Wave uh, totally or even this X uh, the, uh, tool. I don't remember the exact name of this because there are several X tools available and one of them is similar to this HTML checker. And another thing is a screen reader, so you definitely need to use it. There are different options. There is even a Windows like Microsoft Narrator, which is inbuilt in Windows, so it is already uh, available by default. Uh, but if Google Lighthouse is not a screen reader, then probably I would recommend uh, you using at least one screen reader in addition to these tools. OK, thank you, Katerina. And the last one question, please answer shortly. Uh, what are the most used tools for accessibility testing? Uh, probably Wave and NVDA. <laughs> because I really hear about them a lot and I see statistics of usage and I see that they are uh, really heavily uh, used. Yeah. Yeah, OK, it was uh, our last questions here. I want to thank you. Thank uh, our audience for your questions. We have created upcoming topics for our conference today. I can't remind you the session is being recorded. It will be available with all the materials by the link later. Uh, I would like to thank our speaker Katerina for the excellent talk and thank you our audience for your participation in the Community Z, QAZ days and this topic session. It has been a pleasure meeting you here. I welcome you to move on to the next topic question session. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye.